All right, so this is a video, just kind of an introduction. Um, my name is Edwin Farr. I'm friends with your um, teacher or scoutmaster or whatever, Scott Jackson. Uh, we met each other through work years ago and just kind of became friends. And I've been promising for years to make him a bow for you. Uh, but it took me years to do it, uh, mostly because I'm not a professional bow maker. I'm not even an amateur bow maker. I'm a tinkerer, a hobbyist at best. Uh, my day job is nothing like what I do for fun, which involves anything with wood, metal, concrete, um, etc. So at heart, I'm an engineer and a uh, and a tinker. Anyhow, this is the uh, so I'm, this is going to be a series of videos and some pictures with voiceover, hopefully not too long, which will show you the efforts I went through to make these two bows that are functional. Uh, which I've sent to you, and I hope that you will enjoy. So the first bow I tried to make was actually one that was sitting around for a long time. The problem was that the two arms were not bending at the same uh, at the same time. Uh, not as I pulled it, but just from a static position. So it wasn't a good way to start a bow. I tried to apply heat in order to make the limbs soft and then bend them, but I did it with a dry heat with a heat gun. It's like a super hair dryer. And that was a mistake because what happened was that wood dried out so badly that when I tried to bend it even a little bit, it snapped the entire limb. So bows have to have a certain amount of moisture, not too much, not too little. The magic number generally between five and 15%. Um, with different woods needing different amounts, but that's generally the, you know, the rule of thumb. Anyhow, the second, well, I'll wait for the next thing. Now, the picture you're looking at right now is a piece of maple wood that I had to cut a straight edge off the back, and it was once cut right out of the middle of a big log. So it had that outer layer of cambrium wood on it, which is kind of like just under the bark, but not quite sap wood. And I thought, well, that should make a decent bow, uh, and it probably would have, but I got too aggressive with it as I was shaping it, and I, I had it down on the tiller stick, and it was bending decently, but uh, a, a, it was soft maple, and so I should have been more gentle with it, and B, I just got too aggressive and foolhardy and snapped it right in half. Uh, later on, I tried to fix it. That'll be the next video. As far as that maple bow that broke, that was the second bow. I decided to salvage it, or try to anyhow, and what I'm doing is I took a piece of deer hide that I had and I cut it into strips and I'm gluing it to the back of the bow. And what that'll do is it'll give it this backing which will, uh, be, uh, for the most part, keep lift off to a minimum. You can see the tip sticking out there uh, and just rags wrapped around it to clamp it somewhat in place as it hopefully dries. And uh, I've never done that before either, so we'll see how it turns out. Well, as fate would have it, I should have waited. Uh, it's possible that I didn't let this bow, after I glued the hide on top of it, I didn't let it dry long enough, and the moisture content might have been too high. But regardless, the, um, the pressure of just stringing it was too much. <clears throat> when you string a bow, a lot of pressure goes on to the bottom and the top limbs because they're not being bent at the same time and they're not being bent evenly because you're kind of manhandling them into place. And that's when the arm snapped on this one. So with two bows failed and broken and the clock quickly ticking down, I knew that this class was on the 8th of September. I had to get something done, functional, and hopefully safe. Did I mention to wear eye protection when you shoot either of these bows? Please do. <laughs> and. Uh, I was also, I'm just getting over a cold. So anyway, I, I looked around my shop. I found a few pieces of wood that I had set aside years ago. I knew they were dry. I knew that I had intended to turn them into bows and it was just time to start working on them. <coughs> okay, Scott, here's what I got. Eh. Now, this bow is tilted to 26 inches. It could be pulled back further, but I would not do it. 
and I'd have anybody who pulls this thing wear eye protection. Ready? It's 20 inches, 22 pounds. It's 23 at 26 pounds. Twenty-nine pounds at twenty-four inches. Thirty-one pounds at twenty-five. Thirty-three pounds at twenty-six inches. Now I'm going to give it a little more of a shave, just to be safe. So you'll have a thirty-pound bow at a twenty-six-inch draw. Don't pull it any further. So the first bow that was a success is the smaller bow you have. It looks like a, a stick. It still has the bark on it. It's actually a sapling off of a tree that I don't actually know what it is. I know that it's not a very soft wood, but it's not a hard wood. And I started to tiller it down, and this is such a good example to show you that it doesn't matter what kind of wood you have. It more matters how you can shape it so that it bends somewhat consistently and it's all about the density and the thickness and the width of that arm of the bow as it goes towards the tips. Sadly I didn't take a lot of pictures with this one because believe it or not I wasn't really trying. I was just trying to do something to figure out how to how to do this properly as it went. So I have no pictures of this one. Now with the, the third bow, which is the sapling bow you have, it's a 26 inch draw, which means it's safe up to 26 inches. Uh, and that's the distance from the, the back of the bow on the handle, where the, the crotch of, between your thumb and your index finger sit, and where the string gets pulled to. Don't pull that bow back further than 26 inches. I don't know if it can handle it. Uh, if it was a hardwood, it probably could but there's a point where there's so much pressure on the back of the bow and so much tension on the face of the, wait, I'm sorry, so much tension on the, the front of the bow that faces away and so much pressure on the back of the bow that faces towards you that certain woods can't stand that much PSI and they will crush and split and go flying everywhere like the first two bows did. In fact, I actually broke some things in the workshop when the uh, second bow uh, failed. It was it was quite uh, catastrophic. <laughs> anyway, the next bow. So I knew I had one bow that would probably work, but I didn't want to take the risk. So I made a second bow. I had a big, I mean big, piece of cedar from a trunk that I had cut down years ago, and I thought, well, you know, this is relatively straight, but it's actually twisted. And so I had to cut through that outer layer of wood on the back of the bow that you're not supposed to cut through. And so in doing that, you can still make a bow. Uh, in, in fact, many people make bows out of wood like that all the time. But you have to put a layer of something on the back so that the different layers or growth rings of wood do not delaminate when you have it under pressure. And that's when basically the 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 plane between the layers of wood on the growth rings is weaker than the wood of the growth rings themselves. So when you pull that bow back, if there is an area where one growth ring ends in the middle of the limb, that's the first place it's going to split off and break. So you can make a bow, a self bow, with only wood out of one piece of wood. You can violate those growth rings, and if that bow is long enough and wide enough, and uh, you don't pull it too hard, and it's not tillered to too high of a poundage, you can still make it work. But there's a chance it will fail that's pretty high. So when you're gonna do that, you can back a bow. And I did the same thing I did trying to save the maple bow, bow number two, with this bow, bow number four. Uh, because I knew that it would need that extra protection, I took some rawhide from the same deer hide that I had, and I glued it to the back of this bow and then continued to tiller it after the fact. Now I told it a little too far. If you look in the bottom limb, you'll see that there's some glue kind of puddled up there. That's there just to give it a little bit extra strength because that's a weak spot in the limb. And if this bow is going to break, that's where it's going to break, probably. All 
All right, as an example, this is a draw knife. And this is a, a very old tool. A lot of craftsmen used these, and some still use these. And you can make your own, actually, but uh, I got this one from a yard sale for like $5. <clears throat> After we I've traced out the profile, I'm going to shave down to that black line, being careful not to go too far. Some woods chip up very easily, and it's easy to go way past your line in a, a blink of an eye. Now this is cedar wood. It's, it's extremely soft. It's not really appropriate for making a bow, but it's great for demonstration purposes. Okay, so now that this uh, profile is shaped out, at this point it's time to start really uh, tillering it down. I'm going to do a little work on the handle just to make it flat enough so that when it comes time to do the fine tillering and whatnot, it will sit on this uh, brace I made here. Other people use a tillering stick. It's just a stick with notches in it. Uh, I just made this because I had a space in the workshop for it. And you see I have two squares clamped over here to see how far down the limbs are bending when we actually bend it. So, next is, uh, I'm actually going to cut not, not, <laughs> notches in the end of the bow here. And then I'm going to start uh, tillering it down just to the point where I can get it to bend evenly. Okay, you can see how I've marked this bow arm now. Well, you will in a second. So this is 7.5 tenths of an inch. That's just, that is the scale that my caliper tool measures in because it's a cheap one from Harbor Freight. And when I come down here a few inches, it's at 8 inches, or 8 tenths, 8.5 tenths, 8.8 tenths. Sorry, 8.8, 8.5, 9.2 tenths, down to 10, and 11. So this arm gets thicker as it goes to the tip, which is the exact opposite of what it should do. So now it's time to shave. And as I shave carefully, I'm going to measure as I go. All right, now there are a lot of different ways to, to test bend a bow or tiller. Tillering is bending it, looking at it, marking it, shaving it down. And actually, we're going to use the draw knives again, but... We're actually going to bend the tips for it and turn them into scrapers, which is a very useful tool to know no matter what you do, whether it's bows or woodwork or anything. Um, so right now I've got this clamped to where this is at four inches, this is at three inches, that's okay. We're not getting that detailed yet. You don't have to use this kind of a setup. Like I said, you can use a stick with notches in it. Some people even just push it on the floor and look at it. I don't have that skill, so I tend to mock up something that's a little bit more formal. Alright, so we're just going to get a little pug. And actually, it's not looking too bad. What I'm looking for is to see if there is bending going on in the entire limb. If all the bending is happening in one spot, I know it's a weak spot, and that's the first thing it's going to break. The goal here is to make the entire limb equally weak, but leaving enough meat on so that it can still throw an arrow well. That goes down to five and six. So actually, this is tillering fairly evenly already. I noticed that there's not there, most of the bending is going on in the mid limb, about right here. So I'm going to shave a little bit off this section and quite a bit off the tips. Actually, I'm going to shave almost all of it. Yeah. So right here, I'm going to mark it. And then it bends there, and then the tips are pretty static. So I'm going to take a bit off both tips, almost the last foot and a half. And I'm just marking it with a pencil here, but I don't want to mark it. This is almost the last half. So now I have my marks. I take it back off the stand and uh, start shaving off pieces. I'll show you the... Uh, Scraper now. Okay, now this this video is going to explain quickly what a scraper is. Now this is a draw knife I was using in the earlier process, and you can see it's a very basic chisel shaped blade. I can't see that camera angle. You see it's a very chisel shaped blade with a, a bevel and then a straight edge. And the goal of a scraper 
Uh, see, this this can be used for a lot of things, like chiseling, <laughs> since it's a chisel edge. But if you want to scrape it, scraping is where you're peeling up a very thin layer off the very top, but it will it won't dig in, and that's very important when you only want to take off a little bit, not a lot. So what we do is you can take a harder piece of metal than the metal you're going to burnish or bend, and you're going to basically push that tip over just like this, and it creates this burr on the edge and I'll show you exactly what I mean right now the last thing I did with this I sharpened it a little bit ago it's not very sharp but <clears throat> this is a burnisher and this is a basically a hardened piece of steel uh, you probably have them in your kitchen and don't even know it uh, they used to be they're used by cooks a lot and machinists and they used to be used by craftsmen a lot you can also use the edge of a screwdriver actually works pretty well but what you're gonna do is you're gonna take it and just very lightly, assuming that this is relatively sharp or freshly sharpened, uh, you're going to try just, just run it over the edge. And what I do is I run it over the edge, I get a little bit heavier pressure, and then I, I roll it up just a bit. And what that does is I just, I just laid that edge over. So that edge comes up and it goes like that just a little bit. And I'll show you what it does on a piece of wood. All right, it's time to do uh, the tillering and scraping. I did a quick uh, stop, not a stop motion, a, uh, I forget what they call it. But anyway, it's a video showing pictures uh, of scraping this bow. And it's showing you how you have to be very careful. If you scrape too far too fast, it's very easy to ruin a piece of wood and it's very hard to fix it after you do. As you go, it's a moving target as you're tillering and pulling this bow back and seeing where it's at. You're kind of targeting certain areas, but at the same time, you're trying to make the whole bow bend a little bit more, a little bit more. Like I said, I'm not going to take this one to full tiller yet because I need to back it first, but you can see that right now it's bending down to about from a <clears throat> three and a half inches to about eight inches. So we're getting about five, so this is almost at brace height, because you have about six inches between the belly of the bow and the arrow where it knocks, uh, where the string's at when it's at rest. So I'm still gonna take a little bit more off the tips. And, uh, and really just after that, I'm just gonna focus on the whole limb overall, but I'm gonna check it as I go. Uh, I also need to glue that rawhide on pretty soon because we're getting to the point where small amounts of wood make a huge difference in how it bends. Okay, so I'm now at the point where this is tillering pretty well, and if I start to um, bend it any further, I'm just worried about all of these little chunks that are missing popping up and this bow delaminating and what happens is if one thing delaminates it creates the new weakest spot and very quickly all that force will go and break the weakest spot so <clears throat> to avoid risking that I'm gonna go ahead and back it now now when rawhide dries <clears throat> it dries pretty hard and fairly quickly um, I'll actually have to ship it to you <laughs> when it's still drying but i'm sure once it hits arizona air it will dry immediately so i'm gonna go up and start cutting the rawhide well i came up and this deer hide is pretty dry not nearly where i need it to be so that i can stick it onto a surface uh, so and i actually need 36 inch strips so i'm gonna have to end up taking it from the other side because there's a seam right here 
You see, the thickness of a deer skin changes as you go to different body parts. The neck is very thick, the arms are a little bit thicker, and kind of like the, the butt and the back areas are pretty consistent. So I'm going to take this stri these strips out of here on this side, but to do that, I've got to get it nice and wet first and uh, kind of get it to soften up so I could lay it out, measure it, and cut it, and then take it down to glue it onto the back of the bow. All right, so I've got those <clears throat> two uh, strips cut out of what was this uh, deer hide here. Now this is from, I think, <laughs> two years ago hunting, and it's amazing how long you can preserve hides without refrigeration, either in salt. I did this one, I, I soaked it in a bucket of industrial vinegar for two and a half years outside, getting rained on, but um, the water would evaporate as fast as it got replaced, and other than the discoloration up here from the actual, you know, bullet hole and... Uh, that was a mistake where I cut the skin. You can see it's in pretty good condition. And the fascinating thing about skins is they look gross, they feel gross, they smell gross as weird, but eventually they end up their soft, pliable leather, or even, I think they used to call it like uh, valerium or something like that. They used to use it for books. When paper was too expensive, they'd use animal skins that were stretched thin, usually goat, and they use them for drums and things like that. Anyway, quick bit of interesting history. The strips are in the sink getting warm. Uh, you can see the end here is a little bit darker and it's also quite a bit stiffer. I think that might have been exposed to the outside so what I'm going to end up doing <clears throat> is starting on the tips with this nice white part which is actually pretty nice um, and then I might clean the back of it up a little bit or some still some other stuff on there and then uh, I'm going to stretch it from the tips. I'm going to stretch it all the way to the handle clamp it in place, and then wrap around it. Of course, this is going to be glued down with just wood glue. So anyway, I hope you enjoy this hastily compiled video and these hastily built bows. Um, in the in the in the possibility that one of them breaks, uh, don't worry, it's it's not a big deal. They they aren't really valuable. Uh, a lot of time did go into them, but you know my I'm not extremely experienced at building them. So uh, I hope that they're uh, interesting. I hope uh, that it's a little bit instructional. There are tons of videos all over YouTube, lots of books you can get, uh, which will give you much better details and, and even uh, techniques than, than I know. And uh, hopefully this has been an interesting uh, evening in your, uh, your studies or your scouting or whatever it is that you're up to. It's been fun. <laughs>